Good afternoon, and welcome to Improving Data Accuracy with Governance, Definitions, and Structure, a complimentary webinar from HealthSystemCIO.com. Just some housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of HealthSystemCIO.com, and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions. You can type them in at any time during the event in the Q&A box, the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Leave the default set to all panelists. We'll be taking them later in the program, but you can send them in as they occur to you. You see the uh, URL for the deck, which you can obtain. There's a shortened URL at the bottom of all the slides, and I will also send it out in the chat box. So you'll definitely be able to get a hold of the deck. And we are recording today's event, so there will be an archive, um, usually ready within two business days, if not sooner. You'll get an email when it's ready, and a separate registration is required. Uh, just so you, you see how we're going to spend our time today, we're probably going to go about 40 minutes. First, we're going to hear from Michelle Ziegler, VP of IS and CIO at Summit Health, and then we're going to have a Q&A with Michelle. So without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Ziegler. Michelle, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Anthony. And thank you, everyone, for uh, attending and, and giving up some time today. Um, want to review the uh, presentation objectives. Uh, we're going to do an overview of Summit Health, a quick one. Um, our IT strate strategic planning process, data and analytics committee overview, data governance, our guiding principles, and the lessons learned that we've had in this journey. Summit Health is a not-for-profit organization that provides acute, subacute, and ambulatory services for the community of Franklin County, which is in South Central PA. We have two acute care hospitals, freestanding ambulatory, three urgent care walk-in locations, two large ambulatory campuses, numerous small ones, um, large multi-specialty, multi-location employed physician practices with approximately 240 providers. So there's about 50 locations throughout the, the county and actually outside of the county of Franklin County that, that we provide services and support to. In the spring of 2014, uh, Summit Health began a multi-year IT strategic assessment and planning process that was facilita facilitated by an external vendor. In this process, we um, did over 90 interviews of groups, um, important key stakeholders, individuals of our board, um, key leaders of our me medical staff, um, and we actually included patients and their family members as part of the interview process to get um, their input on, um, you know, their, their needs uh, from a technological uh, standpoint. And using the input that was gathered and working closely with senior management, six major themes were identified in our IT strategic planning process. Two of those uh, themes were IT governance, and, and that's just not your, your typical IT governance, but it was also identified that included in that was data governance, and data analytics um, were also identified as two of the six major themes. And a it became a focused outcome of our strategic planning process. Prior to the um, start of the strategic planning process, Summit Health had completed a selection of an enterprise business intelligence tool. We started that in the beginning of 2013. We had the uh, BI tool and the staff in place. They had um, gone through their training. We had done the implementation. We did our first proof of concept um, project. And at that point in time, we were really struggling um, with data governance. We had some barriers with data definitions. And, and when I say that, we had literally three separate systems that we had different numbers for our 30-day readmissions. And each one of those systems collected them a bit differently. Um, and we weren't, we didn't have a body to really help us determine which was going to be the metric we were going to follow. That's really not an IS. Um, we can be part of the process, uh, but we're, we're not the final uh, decision makers. 
This next slide was basically a synopsis of our uh, four-year high-level strategic plan. And you'll see the items that I highlighted in red dealt all with data, data analytics, data governance. Um, so it became a key focus uh, of our efforts moving forward. Out of that, what we put together um, is this organizational chart that, that I'm, I'm sharing with you in this slide. We have the Executive IT Governance Committee, which is really our summit senior management. We have a Senior IT Steering Committee, which is a, a, a new uh, committee that we did. And really, it's a subgroup of senior management. It's a small uh, group that represents um, the hospitals, the practices, physicians, finance, and uh, marketing, um, community and marketing. You'll see um, as a drop down from there um, that we, we formed a data and analytics governance committee. And that committee's role is to establish policies and procedures, to monitor and manage benefits, um, to in, include the data analytic members from, from a multidisciplinary approach. And they actually establish problem solving teams when needed to, to uh, you know, investigate if we have any uh, data discrepancies uh, between several systems. Um, and to come back to the committee with a recommendation of what should be our source of truth, what should be the analytic measure that we use um, in, our, in the respective dashboard that it's being asked to be included in. It's actually chaired by our VP of Community Relations who uh, does a lot of uh, marketing analysis she actually was the, the second uh, proof of concept project that we uh, put together using our um, business analytic tool. And she raved about it and she's an active user and, and through that effort she volunteered to lead our data and analytics governance. She's also a member of the Senior IT Steering Committee. So you can see the relationship there. Here is a more um, detailed uh, purpose, roles, and responsibility of, they, they approve the data definition standards, they help determine our source of truth, they approve processes to acquire, maintain, and analyze data. As we began to look at that particular item of responsibility and began to build some of our dashboards or some of our analytic applications, we realized that people were collecting things in a very manual or somewhat um, archaic fashion. And we spent time automating their data collection um, processes, uh, creating a standard process that could be repeated and even automated so that the, the collection and reporting of that could be streamlined. I will tell you that that's one of the lessons learned um, that it's later on in the slide deck, but it's probably appropriate that I, I take a minute and talk with you about that. Some people became very afraid because a lot of their job was around collecting data. And really one of our goals was if we spent 10 hours of collecting data, we wanted to cut that to you know, being 10% of the time so that more time could be spent in analyzing the data and doing something with the information. Um, if we weren't uh, keeping track with certain indicators, um, we need to free up folks' time so that they can do something uh, with that data. And we really had to work, uh, the Data and Analytics Committee worked with a couple of areas to really help that group understand and help the leadership support the staff who were doing all this data collection so that they could understand what, what their new role uh, could be, uh, could expand to. Um, they uh, established problem solving teams as I, um, I, I alluded to before. One of the recent problem solving teams was we have an analytics application that, that was vendor specific. Um, and we realized that there were only two people utilizing the tool, and it's a pretty large um, um, application. And uh, we learned what they were using the tool for, 
um, and the problem solving team helped us to create that reporting mechanism in our BI tool, and we're going to be sunsetting that uh, vendor specific uh, BI tool. Um, they review and prioritize our project request. Uh, we just actually, within the last two months, created a more effective mechanism to do that. Um, they review and select projects for approval, and they forward them actually to our senior IT um, uh, steering committee. Um, they review requests for new analytic tools uh, and makes recommendations. And actually, we did have a request come through um, recently, I would say in the last four months, and it was denied um, with the caveat that if the um, data analytics staff couldn't come up with a reasonable proof of concept within the three-month time period, that we would move forward with the purchase of that analytics tool. And I'm, I'm very pleased to say that that group stepped up to the challenge and we were able to meet that. And that's a very different, uh, I would say a year ago, um, even though we would have those conversations, um, that, that purchase might have gone through. Um, they uh, monitor and publish uh, data quality reports. Uh, they're in very interdisciplinary membership. And um, when I say uh, data quality reports, it's, it's the reports of what their activities have been. Where have they been able to save time? Where have they been able to um, reduce uh, and come to a single source of truth? Um, well, as we've built these analytical tools and as we've built the dashboards, what has that been able to facilitate from an operational perspective? What benefits have we gained? Some of those types of things, they're actually starting to calculate. We also recently implemented a 30, 60, 90 day follow-up. Once we develop uh, and turn over uh, a dashboard after it's had its integrity testing, we do a 30, 60, 90 day follow up with that area to make sure that the analytic tool or dashboard is meeting the user's need, what they've been able to do with it. Do they now have different questions or different needs that perhaps the original scope um, didn't initially meet? Um, and that has been going uh, very well. The chairperson, I, I actually was, was tickled with her, um, one of the slides that she had uh, about three months ago shared with the committee. She said, data governance is an organizational discipline driven by the business but enabled by IT. It really isn't an IT project, but it is a large organizational project that IT really needs to be a part of um, and partner with all the multidisciplinary areas. Uh, disciplinary areas to get the value uh, out of these tools. Here's the uh, guiding principles uh, that we developed and actually put when we kicked off the team. We were trying to describe where we were currently, um, which, you know, each individual project acquired, managed, and analyzed data to achieve its singular objective. Um, and the benefit was, you know, sense of control. The challenges we had were, uh, you know, t the time invested in data gathering um, was significant versus data analysis. We had little investment in long-term solutions to known problems. We sometimes had delays. We did a lot of things redundantly. And then with the data governance, um, what we were really trying to accomplish is each team in each effort builds on an enterprise data program, helps build our metadata repository. Um, and the benefits were that data improves over time, leaving more time for analysis. So back to the collection process. Data is fixed once and leveraged across multiple projects, and we've had numerous examples of that where someone has come to us for an analytic tool, uh, for example, the hospitalist came a month ago, and we were able to repurpose those uh, about 
70% of what they were asking from another data analytics tool and just add the other 30% of the, the, the data points that they were looking for. Um, and it really, uh, we were able to turn that around in a, in a month. Um, projects are completed on time and on budget. And the challenges are it requires an investment of resources in the actual data management and it has a longer project timeline in year one, which is actually what we're seeing. And also, as part of our new data governance structure, we did a uh, kind of a SWOT analysis. Where were we at? Um, and where, where did we see our future direction? And so you'll see that this depict, we took six areas, and the, um, the diamonds are basically um, where we were at, where data governance was managed at the department level, but our goal was to move it, move it over towards the right, that some data governance will still be managed at the enterprise level, and then the ownership is going to continue to shift to the enterprise level. Data integration, you'll see we were far to the left, and really where we wanted to be was in the midline of, um, you know, the, the second and third column. So we really were at data is integrated with access by analytical tools, and we are moving towards that the internal and external data is integrated once for use by many analytic tools, including the financial and clinical data. We have, um, I'm sure we're not alone, we have a lot of different disparate tools that had silos of data. And this is really what the data integration is about. It's not really an, an interface as we try to think of, of, of uh, you know, data integration. But it's more breaking down those silos um, and looking at, you know, a patient across the inpatient, the hospital ambulatory, the physician ambulatory, um, the, um, you know, the other aspects, uh, not only from a clinical but a financial side, marrying external data such as, you know, Prescani data, um, you know, some of our marketing type data, and getting a more fuller view, richer view of our operations, of our patient flow, of um, just multi-purpose and analytic tools that you can begin to ask and answer different questions um, with. The analytics access, we really had a lot of standard reports, and they were, um, they were really um, kind of retroactive, which means you'd get a report at the end of the month or for a period of time. What we want to, uh, what we're moving and, and gravitating to is uh, real-time predictive analytics. Now, we're not there because we're developing our dashboards and our self-service analytics. And really, people right now, we're really trying to help them put these real-time dashboards and self-service analytics into their workflow, um, which some areas have really gravitated to that pretty easily and, and others haven't. Um, so that, that is another goal of the Data and Analytics uh, Governance Committee. The analytics um, confidence in the data, the analysts spend 80% um, of their time collecting and validating data, where in the future uh, we really want clinical and financial data is perceived as timely and accurate. So we implemented many, many um, validation and data integrity um, steps until a analytic dashboard is released into um, the live analytics tool. Um, and a lot of that ownership, um, almost all of it, falls back on the actual data owner uh, or the owner of the analytics tool. Um, controls. Um, IT rather than the business manages access and quality. And through that, we're doing the governance so that uh, we break down those silos of data and we provide um, access to data and do it through um, the protocols established by the enterprise data governance uh, 
committee and program. We also recently adopted um, another guiding principle. We're using the SBAR uh, method. Um, we used it, um, for example, I gave you an example of how uh, we started to use it. The ED length of stay was a, a key indicator that uh, we were uh, working through. Um, we would have to fill out the sponsor at uh, the data and analytics governance and who submitted it and the status. Um, but we would use this to work through um, the actual method um, and document um, how we came up with these indica indicators. We've actually taken that through to when we, when we publish any analytics dashboard, we actually have a tab that uh, provides a level of, a fairly detailed level, of every single data element, how it's, where it was collected, how it's um, collected, and who is the owner. In case as you're looking at this, you have some questions and you need to, to you know, call somebody or contact that. So that method of documentation, not only in the data and analytics governance exploration process, but it's carried through to the actual development of the data analytics dashboard or application, because sometimes these are many applications that um, we just publish a, a high-level dashboard as the first page. Lessons learned. Um, this really is a long marathon and not a sprint. That's why when we did the kickoff with the newly formed data and analytics governance group, we we outlined that this is going to take some time. So if the folks that volunteered to be on that committee thought that this was just going to be a three-month or a six-month, you know, project, then we're going to dust our hands off and move to something else, it, it, it's not. Our, our organizational data is one of our key assets. And as we um, move to more data-driven decisions, to more real-time analytics, um, you can't do that without a good foundation. And the good foundation is not only our um, enterprise business analytics tool, but the governance of that. Um, we still have work to do in our data quality, our metadata definitions, new roles, responsibilities, accountabilities, and processes. We're trying to develop standard work processes um, for all the data that's collected. And a lot of this data isn't in our core systems. Um, we probably underestimated the, um, the impact of automation of the data collection processes, and I mean impact on the worker from, um, the worker bees from helping them define their new roles. Um, accountability and ownership of use and change of the data, and I can give you an example of, of that, is if we were collecting a key indicator in um, the ED, establishing the, the accountability and the ownership of that data. So if there's a process change, or if we do a system upgrade, or something influences that process that we don't, that somebody is aware of that and can collaborate with us in advance to make sure that we're still gathering that data um, in, an, in, in an effective and quality manner, or if it's going to change, we have, we have a proactive reanalysis of that data element um, or can document uh, the change in process in case it modifies what we're collecting at all. Another thing um, that we uh, recently began to talk about is something that, that, that was kind of like an aha moment for us. And it's called line of sight of key indicators, of, key, of our key indicators. As I was rounding on some of the nursing units and talked about some of our CAUTI indicators, some of our infection control indicators, um, one uh, nurse manager said to me, I see those organizational metrics, and I, I see that it either increases or decreases, but what does that mean to my nursing unit? 
how do I know for each one of those indicators what my experience is on the nursing units and not 30, 45, 60 days ago, more real time. So for several of our indicators, we are doing um, more, more reporting, more individualized reporting. You have a way to do the aggregate organizational, but to break it down by unit, by area, whatever is important to that staff and unit manager so that they, they know what their part of that indicator is. Um, so that's something that we like to always keep in mind, the line of sight, um, and to make sure that we collaborate um, and get that input from whether it's our nursing leaders or other clinical leaders. Um, governance and senior leadership buy-in is a key concept. Um, and I'm not sure initially we had huge buy-in. Um, I think some believed it was the right thing to do and that we needed to move towards more timely, actionable uh, metrics. Um, and, and to decrease the silos of data that we had. Uh, but I think after about six months of our efforts and demonstrating what the power of what we can do through some of these analytic tools, we now have more uh, buy-in um, to data governance. You need to establish clear goals and objectives to use the data for improvement efforts as part of the request process. And this is just a discipline. This is no different than IT projects. Is If you're going to put a lot of effort into creating something, to building something, you need to be clear as to how you're going to use it and what, what's going to change. And then hold people accountable to that. And that was something that our data and analytics governance group really was passionate about. When they looked at the number, uh, one of our first uh, committee meetings, they had asked uh, our core hospital HIS system, how many static reports do we run? Uh, so we went back and, and we run over 5,000 reports. And then the question was, well, do they all get used? And the, you know, my IS leaders had to say, not sure. So they didn't want that repeated as we went forward with our analytics and dashboard tool. Um, which is another reason why the next bullet, we established 30, 60, 90-day follow-up processes once the dashboard or analytic application has been published. So we follow up with the sponsor and the owner of that application, and we try to gather what are those benefits. Um, train and support the transition from static reporting to analytic tool, and, and then using an analytic tool takes a mindset. And I will tell you that although some folks have asked for uh, analytic tools, they're still stuck in that static reporting mode. So it's understanding and helping them uh, through those transitions. There is one person that we've trained four times. Um, and if it takes three more times, we're gonna do that till he feels comfortable in that. So he begins to use that um, because that's really the importance. Don't let perfection stand in your way. Uh, plan, do, study, act. We're a lean. Uh, we have adopted the lean, Virginia Mason lean um, uh, practices uh, about two years ago. So we heavily believe in plan, do, study, act. Processes often break up large, you know, those processes, and we break up large an an analytical projects into phases to deliver results faster to the customer. We had this perioperative dashboard, and it was very complex. Um, and if we did the whole entire thing, they would have waited a couple of months before we completed it. So instead, what we said, what we negotiated with the, the um, owner, who's our director of perioperative services, we can give you these things in phase one, and we can do these things in four to six weeks so that you begin to have these items to, to work through any opportunities you have. And then 
you know, help us understand what you would like in phase two. And then by phase three, and we laid it out, we committed to it, they committed to the process changes because all of this data they were not collecting or they weren't collecting it, um, they weren't collecting it 100% of the time accurately. So, you know, they agreed to do what they needed to do to make sure that the data was, was um, being collected and accurate. We gave them the phase one of the analytics tools. They were able to do some things. Um, and then we've continued to, to deliver phase two and phase three. So when I say don't let perfection stand in your way, um, it doesn't mean that we don't do a, a good job or integrity. It's breaking up, um, you know, large projects so that you, you deliver business value to someone um, uh, continually. Um, document your improvements and celebrate your successes. So that sums it up uh, on our journey, which we're not done yet. So I'd like to hand it back over to Anthony. Very good, Michelle. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, now we have a little time for some Q&A. So if you have any questions for Michelle, go ahead and send them in uh, in the Q&A box and leave the default set to all panelists. So we'll take a look at those. All right, Michelle, let me start out with the first question. Um, you talked about the challenge of communicating to those who collect data about how their roles were going to be changing. Uh, can you elaborate on what type of messaging you used and did you encounter resistance? Yes, we encountered resistance in areas. Um, and we would assure people that, you know, we weren't here to eliminate their jobs. Um, we had some, some canned scripts that we had come up with, but we also went back to that data owner because the owner of the data isn't always the individual we had to work with to automate the collection process. So we made sure that we um, worked with the owner of that data. And if one of us on the analytics team uh, had to intervene and, and talk with somebody in a leadership role, um, we did that as well. And it wasn't done in a punitive manner, manner in any way. It was in the spirit of change, in the spirit of helping people to accept the change um, and so that leadership sometimes could help folks through that. Um, and if it was some additional skills they needed with analyzing the information, we certainly partnered with them uh, to help them through that. Very good. Uh, next question, what are some of the ways you're marketing your successes either internally or externally? We are actually going to develop, uh, the DNA committee is developing a, their own dashboard of sorts. And it's, um, they actually have a section in our, they actually have their own dashboard, which is a subset of our IS project dashboards. So they monitor their projects, they're documenting successes, they're documenting time savings, um, benefits that, been, that have been achieved. Um, I haven't seen the, the, it's in a draft format. I haven't seen a copy of that yet, but I know some people are, are working on that. And we plan to publish that um, every six months. Now, this data and analytics committee is only nine months old. Um, so, you know, we're still storm and form and norm and growing in our, um, <laughs> growing in, in, in our efforts. So, I would think in the next two months we should have that first draft um, report published, but it's really coming from the data and analytics group because the committee, because it is an organization effort. Very good. Um, what are your staffing levels dedicated to data profiling and improving data quality? Are they at a corporate level or distributed across your organization? IS is at the corporate level, uh, so we support all entities uh, within Summit Health. Uh, currently, from just a data analyst perspective, and we partner very tightly with finance too because they have they have some some niche they have some financial analysts that do 
uh, a lot with uh, financial performance, et cetera. But in the IS realm, we have, we have five data analysts. But then we have application analysts will, that will help the data analysts with anything coming out of some core systems, et cetera. Okay, very good. Uh, do you have an escalation process that helps resolve conflicts? Yes, with any um, IT-like project, we have uh, an escalation process. So if something couldn't get resolved at the the project level, it gets, for a data and analytics uh, project, it would go to the data and analytics governance committee. If they couldn't resolve it, then it goes up that org chart to the senior IT steering committee. And then for, for IS-like projects that don't involve data and analytics, they would follow the path of the senior IT steering committee. Very good. Um, next question. Uh, you mentioned that you uh, engaged over 90 individuals and groups um, as part of your assessment process. Did you feel that was uh, too many, too few, or did you did you hit that right? I think it was right. Um, we got a good cross-functional um, input on people's needs so that it was a very well-balanced plan and really I was pleased to see that, you know, two of the six indicators were, were regarding data um, and analytics and governance, you know, whether it be IT governance or the governance of data. Very good. Um, much of, uh, it sounds like much of what you're talking about in, in terms of data governance is in line with what CIOs have been trying to do for a long time, which is to centralize um, things that affect them and, and affect IT. Uh, for example, it used to be different technologies being purchased at a departmental level and you find out about them and, and they don't fit in with the overall plan. So then, you know, getting that control so that it's got to go through uh, a centralized IT department so everything fits. It sounds like the same kind of dynamic to a certain degree in this process. Is that accurate? Yes, that is accurate. Maybe you can expand a little bit on that and maybe some of the tools that are being leveraged to make sure, you know, I know sometimes it would go through purchasing. You would, uh, I had a CIO describe it as that different nets where you would catch these things. Um, talk about the nets maybe to catch things being done one-off from a uh, um, data point of view. Sure. We have uh, established corporate-wide purchasing policies where any um, IT or interface or clinical piece of equipment that gets interfaced to, you know, our core HIS systems, anything in radiology requires IS sign-off. Um, and materials management is very good about that. Um, we collaborate with people in advance. We're um, very much a part of the budgeting processes, the capital budget processes. We see all of those capital equipment requests before they even uh, go through the finalization. And then I'm on the uh, finance committee of the board. Um, so I see anything that's unbudgeted that comes up, um, and I certainly see everything that, that's budgeted. Um, and so we have a good handle on the capital where we've, um, fine-tuned more in the last couple of years is the things that come through in the operating budget that sometimes don't appear to have an IS implication, uh, but do. Um, so we're pretty good. And actually our end users, um, they're, they're really good. They're, they're pretty good at engaging us in advance. Uh, we occasionally have a new manager that, you know, just doesn't understand that and, you know, it, it just takes a conversation or two. And they understand that we're not, we're not there to uh, you know, you know, be the IS czar, but we want to partner with them, understand their needs, and make sure that we don't already have something else that will will meet their needs. Um, so, in the data and analytics committee, um, we have two examples um, in, that we that what we tackled in the last nine months. Um, one was the we have a time and attendance system that. Um, that we had bought a specific analytics package about two years ago, um, and 
the usage, we only had two people using it. Mm -hmm. um, and so we went through and d put together a problem-solving team, determined what they were using it for, um, and clearly they wanted to use it much more if they could integrate it with the census information, but have census um, captured several times a day, because nursing census changes a lot. It's very different at 7 a.m. than it is at 3 in the afternoon, than it is at midnight. So having a continuous, um, so that's where we could marry it with another piece of information that wasn't even in there, and we're sunsetting that analytics tool. The other example is we had a recent project um, that was approved, it was an unbudgeted approval through the Finance Committee um, to look at our care coordination, um, care variation processes, and embedded in that um, consulting agreement was a, a data and analytics tool. Um, so that data and analytics tool went through uh, the data and analytics government governance um, with a recommendation in Summit Senior manage, Senior IT Management Steering Committee. I'm sorry, I, I called them something wrong. Um, <laughs> agreed with them that we would not move forward with purchasing that. We would we would contract to use it during the engagement, but during that time frame, IS had basically three months to do a proof of concept that we could develop a similar or better uh, data analytics tool to monitor those um, key indicators and the success of them. And we were able to do that, actually do that before the, the three months and actually create additional data elements for them to analyze, so more value. So that was an example of a data analytics tool that, it, that you know, since we were still really new in our formation, um, they, you know, it was, there was a caveat, you know, if we couldn't do the proof of concept, go ahead and buy it, but we're not going to sign, sign up for it immediately because, you know, we're going down this, this assessment and um, redes massive redesign. So that, that was another success. Where in the past, um, I'm not sure those two decisions would have, would have been made or they would have had to have been driven by IS and it would not have probably felt well. Or I think you know what I'm trying to say. It's, you know, that big brother where really it's a collaboration. Um, so we're moving Absolutely. more towards that. Right. Uh, one more quick question um, from the audience. Can you describe what is meant by data ownership at the enterprise level? Yes. Um, data enter uh, the enterprise level would be um, that we have silos of information. Um, so finance would own all the finance. And we would be able to see our data at the enterprise level instead of hospital, ED, surgery center, you know, our owned practices, and then our marketing. So we, we need to pull that data out of all of our subsystems and get it at an enterprise level, but also establish that ownership as well. Because we struggle with that even in our silos. So to think that when we put it in an enterprise view that we're not going to struggle with that. Um, I, I think would be a, a disservice to the process. So that's really why we have to have both. Um, it's ownership of the data because IS and the analytics tool doesn't own the process that's used to collect the data. Um, so we need to make sure that we have that accountability step in step, hand in hand. Very good. Well, that's a perfect uh conclusion for our event. I want to thank uh, our speaker, Michelle Ziegler, for joining us. Um, totally appreciate her presentation and participating with us in this webinar. As I mentioned, you'll receive an email when our archive recording is ready. Um, if you hold the CHIME CHCIO certification, attending our webinars gets you one CEU. And if you've asked us to let CHIME know, we will. If not, make sure you let CHIME know. If you're interested in sponsoring one of these events, reach out to our Director of Sales, Nancy Wilcox, and she can inform you about uh, the benefits of sponsorship.
questions, comments, you can contact me. And you can uh, go to our site to see our upcoming uh, schedule and our last 12 months of archived events. So with that, I, I again want to thank Michelle and thank our attendees, and everybody have a wonderful day.